Fair Park, A Triumphalist Vision of White Supremacy. This presentation is a part of the Deracialize the Dallas Landscape series, which is part of the Shawnee Project. This is an admission ticket to the Texas Centennial with the Six Flags theme in terms of the banners the six figures are carrying. The Texas Centennial was seen in 1936 as a classroom and a set of instructions to teach students the history and meaning of Texas. The press repeatedly emphasized that the Centennial was important to teach Texas history and a considerable effort was done to bring students to the Centennial. Further, the Texas Building and the Hall of State in the Texas Building were seen as inspiration to future ages, that they would instruct future generations of Texans on the history of Texas and the meaning of Texas. An effort was undertaken to have all the students of Texas attend the Centennial. Railroads reduced their fare. The state legislature was interested that all students would attend. And the whole scholastic population of the state was expected to attend the Centennial. They thought it was very important that this fair, this Centennial, communicate the meaning and history of Texas to the students of Texas. 6.5 million people visited Fair Park during the 1936 Centennial Exposition. Why is this important? Why should we care at all about Fair Park? The Texas State Fair alone receives over 2 million visitors each year. Over 5 million people attend Fair Park each year. The Texas State Fair in 10 years will have received over 20 million visitors. Fair Park in 10 years will have received over 50 million visitors. Fair Park with its art and architecture is still teaching the 1936 Texas Centennial lessons on the history of Texas and what it means to be a Texan. So we need to ask the question, what lessons does the art and architecture of Fair Park teach to visitors? The Texas Centennial defined itself as an empire exhibition. This is the introduction to the foreword. I read it. This is the official guidebook of the Texas Centennial Exposition. It has been designed to tell you the complete story of an empire on parade, the location of buildings, attractions, and exhibits. Something of the glamorous history of Texas has been included, although no book, no exposition can do justice to that thrilling story. Notice how the words and the phrase, an empire on parade, are capitalized. This is the title of a story. In the souvenir guidebook, there's a section titled, An Empire on Parade. This section of the souvenir guidebook reiterates the idea that this is an empire exhibition. Reading the first extract, Against a background of history made brilliant by the story of mission priest and Spanish Don, pioneer and frontiersman, the sharp imprint of Texas will be revealed. Art and science, commerce and industry have been merged in the Texas Centennial Exposition to tell in graphic reality of the thrilling climb up the steep heights of empire. Reading the second extract, Texas. Through the medium of the Texas Centennial Exposition, presents an empire on parade. This is a postcard of the Esplanade of State and the Reflection Basin with the Hall of Texas State in the background at the 1936 Texas Centennial. The Esplanade is described in the official souvenir guide. The introduction to the Esplanade of State 
section in the guidebook is as follows. We have already noted the imposing vista presented by the esplanade of state as you enter the grounds. Perhaps no single view of the entire exposition has more gracious charm, dignity, and magnificence. As you stand at the western end of this promenade and look towards the $1,200,000 Texas Hall of State, the full power and scope of an empire on parade is impressed upon you. Notice the phrase, an empire on parade, is capitalized. With the porticos and the tranquil pool, the murder and mayhem of Texas history is transformed into the orderly progression of history, arriving at its logical conclusions. The 1936 Texas Centennial was only one of many empire exhibitions and colonial expositions of the white supremacist imperial world of the interwar years. In the 1930s, multiple empire expositions used Art Deco and other modernist architecture to portray their white supremacist regimes as being modern and progressive. The following are some other self-representations of empire exhibitions and colonial expositions. This is the entryway to the Exposition Coloniale Paris, 1931. Here we have a system of white supremacist worldwide colonial oppression made to seem modern and of the future. This is the Brussels Exposition, 1935, which had the Belgian Congo as a prominent element. Notice the promenade leading up to a large modernistic building. This is the cover of the brochure for the Empire Exhibition in Johannesburg in 1936. This is the Empire Exhibition in Glasgow, Scotland, in 1938, if you didn't look really closely, you might mistake it for the Texas Centennial. This presentation is divided roughly into three parts. First part is to consider the Confederate elements in Fair Park. The second is to consider the triumphalist white supremacy of Fair Park. Third part is more a review of Art Deco and modernist architecture in the interwar years in empire exhibitions. After the centennial presentation, there's a brief presentation about the Pan American exhibit. And this involves the erasure of Latin America and another building with a non-white identity being torn down. The Pan American exposition was in 1937, the year following the 1936 Texas centennial. What you see with this postcard is the Pan American Exhibit Hall, which was the Ford Building from the 1936 Centennial, painted and reused as the Pan American Building. This erasure of Latin America can't really be understood until you understand what the 1936 Texas Centennial was about. One of the monuments in Fair Park is the Sidney Smith Memorial Fountain. This is a postcard mailed in 1919 showing the Sidney Smith Memorial Fountain at its former location. These next three pictures are three different views of the Sidney Smith Memorial Fountain at its present location in Fair Park. In the front of the fountain, there is a plaque, the golf cloud erected 1916 in memory of Captain Sidney Smith, first Secretary of State Fair of Texas from 1886 to 
in 1912, designed by Miss Clyde Chandler, sculptress. Sidney Smith was born in Alabama in 1839 and grew up on a plantation. He went to the University of North Carolina and graduated in 1859 and started his life as a planter in Mississippi in 1860 with slaves. He enlisted in Nathan Bedford Forrest's corps in the Confederate Army when the Civil War started. He rose to the rank of captain. He remained a planter until 1876 when he left, supposedly for health reasons, and entered the farm machinery business in 1878. In 1886, he was made secretary of the state fair, which he held until his death in 1912. Sidney Smith was a member of the Sterling Price camp of the United Confederate Veterans, who adopted a resolution when Smith died. The resolution is as follows, that Camp Sterling Price heartily approves of the move of the fair and leading associations in the city and the citizens of Texas to erect a monument to the gallant Confederate and good businessman Captain Sidney Smith, and that Colonel J. A. Orr of Columbus, Mississippi, the only living member of the Confederate Congress, be selected to participate at the unveiling of the monument at the next state fair in October. Dallas has the Orr Street named after him. It's down by the Dallas Heritage Village. In the late 19th century and the early 20th century, in America and in Europe, there were human zoos where non-white people, often colonial subjects, were exhibited along with other exhibits. This is a postcard of Indians and supposedly a caravan. And this takes place at a zoo in Paris called Jardin de Acclimatation de Paris. The title of this postcard is Les Galles à Jardin Zoologique de Acclimatation. These East Africans are exhibited as zoological specimens like the zebras that stand behind them. These exhibits were set up to emphasize the difference between the white colonizers and the colonized. And one way they did this was to have the colonized be in various states of undress, such as in this postcard at Jardin de Acclimatation. This is a postcard of a French woman at Jardin de Acclimatation viewing an African drinking a French beer. Let's examine this closer. The African is being examined as if he or she was an exotic bug. This is an ad for the Texas State Fair in 1898, which appeared in both the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Time Herald. At the bottom, you can see that Sidney Smith is the secretary and general manager of the State Fair and W.H. Gaston is the president. One of the attractions advertised is the antebellum Negro Village. So far, I haven't been able to find out much about this antebellum Negro Village. I've been looking through the records. And the only thing I've found is this description in one short newspaper article in the Dallas Time Herald, which I'm going to read. Saturday Eve Before the War, is one attraction on Amusement Row which is receiving the attention of nearly all the visitors to the fair, especially the ladies, and is pronounced by them to be one of the most attractive features of the fair. The scene represents the old-time Negro quarters on a big southern plantation on Saturday evening after the day's work is done. All the old uncles and aunties and the little pickaninnies on the plantation are assembled in front of the cabins, and then the evening's frolic begins. There is an old plantation breakdown ending with a cakewalk as the cakewalks were in antebellum days. There's buck and wing dancing by young Negroes and Negresses, banjo solos, songs, etc. And as an old uncle draws his bow 
across the strings of a fiddle that may have seen better days but has lost none of its sweetness of tone, the young Negroes seem magically touched in such dancing and cutting. Of the pigeon wing has never been seen since the days of 61. The Negro village is just as true to nature as anything can be. There is not an objectionable feature to the entertainment and if any person, especially ladies, wish to enjoy a half hour and at the same time get a glimpse of Negro life in the South before the war, this is the place to go. Notice in the text they're referred to as being true to nature, not true to life, but true to nature as if they are zoological objects. W. H. Gaston, president of the Texas State Fair, was a Confederate captain during the Civil War. A major street in Dallas, Gaston Avenue, is named after him. The Sidney Smith Memorial Fountain needs to go. Gaston Avenue needs to be renamed. In 2017, in an essay in the Dallas Morning News, Michael Phillips and Ed Sebesta asked that the name of the Gaston Middle School be changed. This needs to happen. The Six Flags Over Texas idea is used repeatedly in the art and artifacts of the 1936 Texas Centennial. Not only are flags used to represent the Six Flags Over Texas idea, but figurines and other artworks are used to represent the idea that the history of Texas is the history of six nations which have had sovereignty over Texas. Here we have a Confederate soldier and he's standing on to seal the Confederacy. On this giant medallion in the Hall of State in the Texas building, six figures are used to represent the six nations over Texas idea. The whole Six Flags over Texas idea is a bucket of hogwash and it would take a small presentation in itself to explain why. So I'm not going to cover it here. However, I am going to discuss one aspect of the Six Flags theme which works to legitimize the Confederacy. During the Civil War, no nation recognized the Confederacy. The American government regarded it as an insurrection. Until 1907, the congressional record used the term War of the Rebellion. The U.S. government's official record is titled the Official Record of the War of the Rebellion. Instead, the Six Flags Over Texas theme makes the Confederacy not an insurrection, but a nation amongst nations. This was a book issued under the authority of the Texas Centennial Commission. It is meant to be a sort of holy book for the Texas Hall of State. This is the title page for the book. Notice it's presented by the Commission of Control for Texas Centennial Celebrations. In the book, the Six Flags Over Texas theme is presented. However, in this case, the pro-Confederate theme of this Six Flags theme is more explicit. Reading the text, in 1861 the Lone Star became the seventh in the banner of the United States of the Confederacy until the stars and bars of the lost cause bowed to the flag of the Union. It's not the flag of the United States of America, it's just the flag of the Union, but the Confederate flag is called the banner of the United States of the Confederacy. The Confederate flag is elevated to be the flag of a nation, but the American flag is demoted to be merely the flag of a faction. In this description of the medallion, again, the United States of America is demoted to being merely the Union. In this section, we read, at the top left, 
the Union, an energetic figure, holds the seal of the United States of America. It's not the figure of the United States of America. Again, it's the figure of the Union. But for the Confederacy, we see at the center left, the Confederacy, in a stately and dignified pose, holds a garland of flowers as by her side we see the seal of states united in purpose at an important time in our history. Here again, six nations, six flags, is used to demote the United States of America as just another phase Texas has existed in and as a faction. This book makes it very clear. It calls the medallion figure the Union figure to be compared to the Confederacy figure. Along the esplanade, there is the portico of Confederate States. You can see it in this picture. Facing the Texas building from the main entrance is the second portico down on the left. This is an oblique view and a front view of the portico of Confederate States. You can see the statue of the Confederacy in front of it. This is a side view of the portico of Confederate States as you approach it headed towards the Texas building. On the inside of the portico, facing the Hall of Transportation entryway, is the medallion for the Confederacy. The state of Texas isn't just a part of the Confederacy, but the order in which it joined the Confederacy as the seventh state is emphasized. The flag has seven stars and the observer is drawn to conclude that Texas is the seventh star to connect Texas identity with the Confederacy. The idea of Texas being the seventh state to join the Confederacy is symbolically represented in the crown of the Confederacy statue. In an idyllic setting, the Confederacy is presented Instead of thinking of the horrors of slavery, the vileness of white supremacy, the slaughter and massacre and war crimes against African American United States troops, you instead have this vista, this building, this statue, which whispers, the Confederacy is beautiful, the Confederacy is beautiful, the Confederacy is beautiful. It is perhaps the most pernicious Confederate monument of all Confederate monuments, since it entices us to love the Confederacy because it makes the Confederacy appear so beautiful. The Confederacy statue, if not a goddess, is certainly a high priestess and makes the Confederacy divine. In the Hall of State, in the Texas building, as you enter, on the right, there's an allegorical depiction of Texas' participation in the Civil War and the Civil War itself. The three Confederate figures on horseback next to the Confederate battle flag are specific historical figures. The two red arrows point to the names of two of the Confederate generals, which are painted on the mural. The three figures from top to bottom on the mural are Confederate Major Dick Dowling, Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston, Confederate General John Bell Hood. You can see their last names painted on the mural to the left of them. Dick Dowling rented slaves for his business. The city of Houston considers Dowling a hero for winning the Battle of Sabine Pass and still has a Dowling monument. By winning the Battle of Sabine Pass, Dowling prevented the Union armies from liberating the slaves of Houston. After the Battle of Sabine Pass, some captured African American sailors were forced into labor at the Texas State Penitentiary, and some captured African American sailors were sold into slavery. The son of General Albert Sidney Johnston wrote a biography of him and had it published in 1878. Johnston's son was proud of Johnston's white supremacy and pro-slavery views. 
and spent some effort to document them and make sure the reader knew of them. His son quotes his father's letter. I'll read the beginning. My dear Will, we are all well and contented with the results of the election. If our northern brethren will give up their fanatical, idolatrous Negro worship, we can go on harmoniously, happily, and prosperously, and also gloriously as a nation. We hope this, although we fear it is asking too much of poor human nature. Johnston's son explains what his father's beliefs were in regards to white supremacy and slavery. I'm going to quote some of his son's comments. General Johnston's view in regards to slavery were those generally held in the South, with no great respect for political abstractions and perceiving clearly the differences that mark race and condition he rejected with scorn the generalizations which overlook all existing facts and confound all the relations of life, but he could not ignore that the manifest inferiority of the Negro fitted him for the place he held and that time alone could fit him for any other. Confederate General Hood and American General Sherman had an angry exchange of letters during the American Civil War. This is a conclusion of a letter from Hood to Sherman. I read it. You came into our country with your army avowedly for the purpose of subjugating free white men, women, and children, and not only intend to rule over them, but you make Negroes your allies and desire to place over us an inferior race, which we have raised from barbarism to its present position which is the highest ever attained by that race in any country in all time. I must, therefore, decline to accept your statements in reference to your kindness towards the people of Atlanta and your willingness to sacrifice everything for the peace and honor of the South and refuse to be governed by your decision in regards to matters between myself, my country, and my God. You say, let us fight it out like men. To this, my reply is, for myself, and I believe for all the true men, I, women and children in my country, we will fight you to the death. Better die a thousand deaths than submit to live under you or your government and your Negro allies. This same panel also incorporates a neo-Confederate idea of the Civil War with the three female figures up in the heavens. In this allegorical representation of the Civil War with three female figures, the American government, the American armies, are represented as being that of the North, not of America. Instead, America is represented by the figure labeled Columbia. In this portrayal, the Confederacy is made to be the equal of the American government. Further, this allegory makes the South and the Confederacy the same thing, as if one term is equivalent to the other. But the historical record is half as many people from the South fought for the American armies as fought for the Confederate armies. Finally, the Confederacy is given a divine figure, and with the flowers in her hands, the Confederacy is represented as being worthy a divine mourning. As you enter the Hall of State in the Texas building, on the far end you'll see a giant medallion. This is a closer view. With this medallion, again, we have the Six Nation theme. The red arrow points to an allegory of the Confederacy. The allegorical figure here, representing the Confederacy, floats on clouds, and on her shield is the seal of the Confederacy. Floating on clouds, this allegorical figure is made to be a divine figure. This is a repeating theme 
in the artwork at Fair Park, the Statue of Confederacy in front of the Confederate States portico is a divine figure. At Fair Park, at the entryway to the building called Grand Place, on the right you'll see a plaque. The plaque is a tribute to Texas women in the Civil War. This plaque is dated 1964. You can see it in the lower right-hand corner. I'm going to read the plaque. Civilian duties of 90,000 Texas men fighting for the Confederacy fell to wives back home in land of few factories and an enemy blockade that cut down on imports. Women had to run businesses and farms for their absent men who committed to the uncertain males their letters of instruction, yet with the help of children, old men, and loyal slaves, furnished army and the Confederacy with grain, meat, and cotton for home consumption and foreign exchange for guns, gunpowder, factory goods, drugs, and other supplies. Ran newspapers, loaded shells, made gun caps, did man's work, of many kinds, in addition to homemaking, sewing, nursing, teaching, and childcare, made medicines from herbs and plants, grew poppies and squeezed the seed pods to supply opiates to the hospitals, carded cotton and wool, spun and wove, then dyed the homemade cloth with barks or roots, plated palmetto or corn shucks to make hats made coffee of acorns or vegetables, tea of sage or orange leaves. On 2,000 miles of coastline and frontier, faced personal hazards from invasion or Indian raids. Elsewhere were in peril from marauders. Through the four years, won admiration for their pluck and maintained faith enough to help rebuild the defeated South. The title is misleading because this isn't really about all Texas women in the Civil War. It's about white Texas women in the Civil War. And it isn't really about all white Texas women in the Civil War. It's about Texas women in the Civil War who supported the Confederacy. And many white people in Texas did not support the Confederacy and were subjects of persecution. This title misleads by erasing the fact that there was dissent during the Civil War in Texas and resistance against the Confederacy and creates the idea that there was unanimous support for the Confederacy. The name on the application for this plaque is Lester N. Fitzhugh, who spoke at local neo-Confederate functions at, with local neo-Confederate groups. That's why you see this reference to loyal slaves on the plaque. The idea of loyal slaves was a standard idea in the Lost Cause mythology, the ideology about the Civil War slavery and reconstruction of the neo-Confederate groups. So what really happened during the Civil War? John H. Cochran, a prominent member of Dallas society and politics, wrote a history of Dallas County. It was published in 1928. Cochran has a chapter on Dallas during the Civil War period. In 1928, Dallas residents would not be embarrassed to be known as white supremacists and therefore were very candid on the issues of race and slavery. So let's read what Cochran has to say on his first page on this, in this chapter. But Dallas County, from 1859 to 1861, had made such rapid and successful progress in the production of wheat, corn, forage meat, and other necessary supplies of food, she was recognized as the center of the food-producing counties of Texas, so much that the Confederate government established and maintained general quartermasters and commissary headquarters at Dallas for the collection of food 
and supplies for the Army of the Trans-Mississippi Department. Also established a transportation and recruiting department there and a manufacturing department at Lancaster, where arms were repaired and pistols manufactured. Dallas was general headquarters for all these departments, so the officers and their families and all necessary details made Dallas their temporary home during the war, thus supplying the place of the enlisted soldiers. So how was Dallas County able to raise all this food and be such a center of supplies for the Confederate Army? On the next page, Cochran explains how this was done, reading from his book, Besides, a large number of Negroes were brought into Dallas County for food and for protection during the war, and were gladly hired to the citizens for their food and clothes. Nearly every family which had no Negroes of their own hired one or more of these Negroes and were thus enabled to cultivate all their land in wheat, corn, and oats. So Dallas County continued to be the great food-producing center of Texas. Its reputation in this respect became so great that many desirable citizens were attracted by its prosperity and permanently settled in the county and contributed much to its future development. Cochran's not completely candid. Notice how he avoids the entire topic of slavery in this passage. The plaque has these poor defenseless white women squeezing pea pods, making tea of orange leaves, a weaving fabric, making hats out of corn shocks, all by themselves, poor and defenseless. Oh dear, all defenseless with Indians out there and marauders. The reality is that slaveholders in the Confederate States were fleeing to Texas with their slaves to prevent their emancipation by the advancing American armies. Flooded with refugee slaveholders' slaves, Dallas residents were able to exploit slave labor for just the cost of feeding and clothing the slaves. By supplying the Confederacy, they became rich with war profiteering off a of war to preserve slavery by exploiting slaves. The presence of a large Confederate military supply operation hardly left them defenseless. As we have seen before, Texas under Six Flags is present in the art and artifacts of the 1936 Texas Centennial. The theme, Texas Under Six Flags, is also the organizing principle of the architecture of Fair Park. The theme, Texas Under Six Flags, was the idea with which the 1936 Texas Centennial constructed its historical narratives. It appears that the concept of Texas being under six flags of the sovereignty of six nations as a popular idea starts with Molly E. Moore Davis's Texas History Textbook for Children, published in 1897. It is a white nationalist history of Texas with white people being the agents of history. Davis wrote a poem praising the Confederate Hood's Brigade. The United Daughters of the Confederacy has a chapter named after her. Davis also wrote poetry and fiction in her writings, she portrayed racist stereotypes using what is called Negro dialect writing. This is where white people speak standard English, but African Americans speak in heavy accents. This novel by Davis in War Times at La Rose Blanc, published in 1888, is about a plantation during the Civil War with loyal slaves who love their masters and wish to serve them if they are Confederate soldiers. In this extract, the plantation owner gives his slave Dandy permission to accompany his son, Tom, as Tom goes off to join the Confederate Army. This extract starts with the plantation owner 
asking his slave Dandy a question. I read, Well, Dandy, he said as he dropped it, what do you want most of everything in the world? And Dandy replied, Please, Mars, I want to go to de war long o Mars Tom. Father broke into a queer little laugh. All right, Dandy, you can go, he said. Brother Tom gave a wild whoop. Dandy made a respectful kerchief and back down the steps, his dark eyes shining. He darted around the end of the gallery where Mandy and I, looking over the railing, saw him throw himself on his hands and lift his heels in the air, crackling them jubilantly together. Molly E. Moore Davis is the person who has given Texas its identity as being under six flags. Along the esplanade are six porticos, one each for each one of the so-called six nations over Texas. These porticos are arranged in an historical progression. First there is Spain and France, then the Confederacy of Mexico, and finally Texas and the United States before you come upon the Texas building. The esplanade becomes an historical timeline and those walking up and down the esplanade are made to experience this historical timeline. Inside each of the porticos, there is a painted medallion. Here you see all six of them. One interesting thing about these six medallions is that for the Mexican medallion, it is the only one having a human figure. The well-known symbol of Mexico is an eagle holding a snake in its beak. And this human figure isn't from the Mexican period in Mexican history. It isn't from the colonial period of Mexican history. It's pre-Columbian. The role of Mexico in Texas history is reduced to one element that they allowed white American immigration. The text under the Mexican medallion makes the purpose of the design of the Mexican medallion clearer. You can see that Mexicans are represented as pre-modern and not white. And in terms of thinking of that time, this representation would show them as primitives. With this medallion and with the text underneath the medallion, Texas independence becomes a racial triumph. By conceiving Texas history as a secession of European style nation states, you're able to exclude and erase those groups which were not or are not organized as nation states. Thus, the history of Native American groups is not told. Native Americans only exist in so much as they are problems for white people. The history of Latinos in Texas as a minority group and their oppression is not told. African American history has no place amongst these porticos. The Negro Hall of Life would have been a disruption of this historical progression of the six nations. Hence, it's not surprising that the Negro Hall of Life was isolated from the rest of the fair, and after the fair was over, it was torn down. Texas history is reduced to a story beginning and ending with white people. Mexico only exists in this narrative to be defeated in a white Texas triumph. This is a booklet issued by the Texas Centennial Commission. In the preface to this book, Colin F. Thomas, president of the Texas Centennial Commission, makes it clear that the celebration is about white racial triumph. I'll read an extract from this preface. It will be far more than a mammoth at modern exposition whose buildings are models of architecture in brick and stone, housing triumphs of invention, miracles of science, and the riches of Texas soil and sun. They'll testify that Texans are not unworthy of the incomparable heritage left to them by martyrs and patriots dying and ready to die 
that Texas might become an Anglo-Saxon commonwealth. He'll commemorate the sacrifices of the plain pioneer women and men and women who first tracked on people's wilds with axe and plow and rifle and spelling book and Bible to lay the mud sills of civilization. Besides explaining that the Texas Centennial is a celebration of a racial triumph, there are a few other key points to be observed in this extract. This extract connects the Art Deco architecture of Fair Park to white racialist triumph. The reference to the unpeopled wilds makes Native Americans not human. This extract also makes Texas pioneers our very own vore trekkers. On the left is a souvenir program for the theatrical production Cavalcade of Texas. On the right is the cover of the official souvenir guide. The Cavalcade of Texas was performed twice a day during the 1936 Texas Centennial. Though the script of the Cavalcade of Texas was copyrighted, we have been unable to locate a copy of the script. However, the Cavalcade of Texas is described in the official souvenir guide. The Cavalcade of Texas was about white racial triumph. Reading the introduction, the spectacle of an empire marching to its destiny through 400 years is to be a feature of the Texas Centennial Exposition at Dallas, June 6th to November 29th. This panoramic extravaganza is Cavalcade of Texas, written and produced as a living saga of the inexorable advance of civilization by blood and iron and, by the, and the enduring will of the white man in what was once only the wild land of the naked savage. Dallas didn't accept racially mixed theater cast, so this is how they made Native Americans for the Cavalcade of Texas theater production. They airbrushed pigment onto white bodies to make Native Americans. There's a reason why the Texas Cavalcade would not try to use a mixed cast. In 1935, the United Daughters of the Confederacy shut down the Oak Cliff Little Theater because the Oak Cliff Little Theater was attempting to use a mixed race cast for one of their plays. The president of the Texas Division of the United Daughters of the Confederacy triumphantly announces at their state convention the shutdown of the Oak Cliff Little Theater. These are the comments from the address of Mrs. C. C. Cameron on the shutdown of the Oak Cliff Little Theater. Her comments are as follows. On my returning to Dallas, our daughters were horrified that a Dallas Little Theater had announced the production of a play using a mixed cast of whites and blacks. Joining other patriotic bodies, after some little controversy, we finally convinced the Little Theater that this must be stopped and the production of the play withdrawn. We would encourage in every way a Negro Little Theater as we would a white, but we believe God was wise and had a purpose in mind and he gave us colors and people as well as colors and flowers. And as a group of Southern people, we wish to return to him his colors as he intended them to be. The Oak Cliff Little Theater account of the racist campaign to shut them down, published in the Dallas Time Herald, details the tactics that were used. I'll read some extracts from the account. On or about May 20, we received a letter from the United Daughters of the Confederacy protesting and stating the show must not go on as it would disgrace the city and the state. The following day, we received a letter from one of the local camps of the United Confederate Veterans, an affiliated organization also protesting the show. Later in the account, they, they report, on Friday morning, we received a telephone call from the secretary of the Commercial Association stating he was besieged with telephone calls and that something must be done. The following day, we received a telephone call from the Commercial Association denying the use of the building. 
in the local histories about Dallas Theater, I find the explanations for what happened to the Oak Cliff Little Theater to be either obscure, misleading, or wrong. At some point, I'm going to do a history of the end of the Oak Cliff Little Theater since it represents a very important story about race and theater and Dallas in the early 20th century, but not in this presentation. D.W. Griffith's movie, The Birth of a Nation, based on the novel The Klansman by Thomas Dixon, is perhaps the most notorious racist film in American history. The Dallas Morning News did multiple articles about D.W. Griffith's involvement in the production of The Cavalcade of Texas, either to show how he contributed to it or show how D.W. Griffith praised it. The movie Birth of a Nation is always referred to by the Dallas Morning News as the immortal birth of a nation. Further, sometimes David Wark Griffith is referred to as the immortal director of the immortal birth of a nation. In this article, the Dallas Morning News wanted readers to know that the producer of Birth of a Nation thought the cavalcade of Texas was excellent. Here, the producer of one white supremacist production is endorsing another. There are some historical narratives out there which portray the Dallas Morning News as the great crusader against the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. And they are true as far as they go, but like so much in Dallas history, it's not the full story. At some point in the future, I plan to supply the missing elements of the history of the Ku Klux Klan in Dallas, but I won't be doing it in this production. In the murals at Fair Park, white people do everything. They are masters of the world and beyond. As you walk through the porticos, you'll see a series of murals. In these murals, white people mine the earth. They weld and forge metals. They navigate the world. They are masters of transportation. They have brought into the world the automobile and the locomotive. They are masters of movie production. They are masters of air flight and radio broadcasting. They are masters of electrical power and the X-ray. They will soar into the heavens with rocket ships. In the murals, in the porticos at Fair Park, white people are masters of all the arts and sciences and technologies. Non-white people are nothing. As you move past the porticos, you come upon the State of Texas building. It is a massive, monumental building. In a row around the top of the building are the names of the governors of Texas. With a few exceptions, it's a rogues gallery of slaveholders, confederates, bigots, and racists. When you enter, there are six statues of persons who founded the slave republic out of Mexico, which had abolished slavery. These are also the heroes who are understood in 1936 as having established a white state out of a mixed race state. Someone is dreaming of a white Christmas. Perhaps they sing, unto us a slave child is given. It should tell you something about Dallas society and its cultural institutions that something like this would be done and no one would raise an objection.
This is the Texas Hall of State looking in from the entrance. It is reported that visitors responded to it as if it was a sacred temple to Texas. Along the walls of the hall on both sides are gigantic murals depicting a historical narrative of Texas. This is a mural on the left side facing in from the entrance, and this is where the historical narrative starts. This is the mural on the right side where the historical narrative continues and comes to an end. The following is a series of views you would see looking between the pillars, starting from beginning to end. Moving on to the right side of the hall, the history continues. Again, in the murals, white people found states, they found educational systems, they settle territories, they build industries, they engage in shipping, they create modern societies. African Americans, in contrast, are shown happily toting bales of cotton. Of all the murals in all the buildings, excepting the Negro Hall of Life, this is the only significant portrayal of African Americans at the 1936 Texas Centennial. In this mural, even the divine inhabitants of heaven, angels, spirits, fates, goddesses, are all white. In the murals of the 1936 Texas Centennial, accepting the Negro Hall of Life, white people run both the heavens and the earth. Let me read the top article. The Patriot reports the suicide of a runaway Negro man in that county. The dogs had treed him, and seeing his master approaching, he drew a bowie knife and plunged it into his chest. The murals in the Hall of State also erase history. The horrors of slavery are omitted. The murder and mayhem of white supremacist violence during Reconstruction is omitted. Instead, you have a statue to make the Confederacy beautiful. The genocidal campaigns against Native Americans are omitted. The oppression of Latinos in Texas is omitted. The struggles, the efforts, the campaigns, the hard work of minority communities to try to achieve something in Texas society under the weight of white oppression is not shown in the murals. This is a mural in the West Texas room in the Texas building. At first glance, you might think this is a stereotypical representation of a family unit. But if you'll notice, there's a father, there's a mother, there's a son, but there's no daughter. This is a patriarchal unit. There's a patriarch, his wife, and his son. Look at the expressions on their face. Not very happy, not very friendly. This is a figure in another mural in the West Texas room. Look at the expression on his face. Looks like he's angry, doesn't look very friendly. I think we can better understand the expressions 
on the faces in the murals by considering the book A Description of Texas by Oran M. Roberts, a former governor of the state of Texas. In the book, he discusses the fate of Native Americans in the state of Texas. From Robert's book, I read, This, however, cannot last long, for this very savage nature, which causes them to strike back as they recede before a superior race, draws upon them their gradual, though ultimate, extermination. This is simply one of the processes at work by which the higher order of man is and will continue to be forced in self-defense, willingly or not, to take possession of and use the earth everywhere, carrying out the inexorable and perpetually operating law of races and of nations to elevate or die. Roberts has a vision of the inevitable and eventual domination of the world by white people with the extermination of non-white people. To Roberts, a sign of the racial inferiority of Mexicans is that they weren't able to carry out a campaign of genocide against Native Americans. Reading the Mexicans during a hundred years under the Spanish monarchy and afterwards under the Mexican Republic made some progress in settling a small part of Texas and in disputing its dominion with the Comanches and other tribes. They were, for the most part, a race of native Indians of copper color, slightly intermixed with Spanish blood. They were partial in their industrial pursuits to hunting for game to, and to the care of herds of cattle, sheep, and horses. And the arts were in the main confined to a level with their occupations. Their cultivation of the earth was very limited in quantity and rude in manner. Reading further, with their standard of manhood and arts of war, the struggle with the wild savages was long and often doubtful in maintaining their position in the country. That difficulty, perhaps, contributed largely to their invitation of the Anglo-Americans to share with them their lands and dangers, which commencing formally in 1821, resulting in establishing numerous colonies with the settlement of white men. Further reading, the antagonism of races soon commenced and was kept up from various grounds until the Anglo-Americans, by the aid of some noble Mexicans, remained masters of the field and established in Texas an independent republic in 1836. In these extracts, we see how Texas masculinity is defined. A Texas man, unlike a Mexican man, is capable of genocide against Native Americans or any other race that threatens the white race. In 2017, in an essay published in the Dallas Morning News, Michael Phillips and Ed Sebesta asked that the Orem M. Roberts Elementary School have its name changed. The Dallas Independent School District needs to change this name. The official souvenir guide of the Texas Centennial Exposition wasn't as direct as Roberts. Violent white men are obliquely referred to as the tall men with long guns or the tall men with long rifles. In this historical narrative, it's the non-Anglo-Saxon, Spanish, and French who have failed to colonize Texas.
During the 1936 Texas Centennial, African Americans were subject to ridicule, derogatory comments, racist comments by the press. Dallas Morning News headlines are, in one article, History of Negro from Jungles to Now to be Shown. In another article, the headline is, Folk Festival Negroid for Emancipation Day. In another Dallas Morning News article about Juneteenth at the Centennial, the reporter writes, Rolling eyes and flashing white teeth dominated exhibit halls. And he writes, Laughter and carefree happiness comes easy to the sons and daughters of Ham, and with the many wonders and attractions of the magic city. This show needs to be understood in terms of how voodoo was perceived by the general public in the 1930s. In the popular imagination of the 1930s, voodoo would have been seen as sinister, savage, primitive. The phrase, seven bewildered blacks, implies that Afro-Cubans would be too primitive and unable to comprehend modern civilization. This show would function essentially as a counter-exposition to the Negro Hall of Life. This show was promoted in the press. You'll notice that in this contest, there will be no interracial dating. In this headline, African Americans are compared to a plague of locusts. The headline reads, Negroes swarm to Centennial for their day. The Art Deco of the 1936 Texas Centennial is to make Texas white supremacist regime look like it is modern, rational, and of the future. The art, architecture, and theater of the Centennial is designed to tell a white supremacist message. The theatrical producers of the Texas Cavalcade, the artists painting the murals, the sculptors, the architects designing the buildings are Dallas's own Lenny Reifenstahls. Their pageants, sculptures, murals, and buildings constitute Dallas's very own triumph of the Texas will. The Hall of Negro Life would not have fitted into the white triumphalist narrative of the 1936 Texas Centennial. There was an opposition to even having a Hall of Negro Life at all at the 1936 Centennial. The racist contractor who built the Hall of Negro Life painted part of the exterior bright red to fit it into white preconceptions of what a Hall of Negro life would look like. With the exterior of the Hall of Negro life painted bright red, it would seem not modern, not sophisticated. It would be less of a disruption to the white triumphalist narrative of the rest of the 1936 Texas Centennial. One tactic used to keep the Hall of Negro life from disrupting the white triumphalist narrative was to put it off in a corner at the Texas Centennial. There were four murals by Aaron Douglas at the Hall of Negro life. Two survive, two were destroyed, and the Hall of Negro life was torn down. Consider all the murals and the porticos leading up to the Texas building. In those murals, white people do everything, sciences, arts, technology. In aspirations, you see a T-squared, a compass, a globe, a chemical flask, a book, and off in the distance, you see the symbols of modernity in the 1930s, skyscrapers, a modern factory with tall smokestacks. If you compare the representation of African Americans in the Hall of State to the representation of African Americans by Aaron Douglas 
in his mural aspirations becomes fairly apparent why the Hall of Negro Life was torn down. Compared to Afrofuturism of Aaron Douglas's mural aspiration with the Art Deco murals in the Hall of State, African Americans with aspirations is not something that the Dallas White Establishment would want. They would want African Americans who are happy to tote bales cotton. Aaron Douglas's Afrofuturism seems modern, fresh, sophisticated of the future. In contrast, the Art Deco of the Hall of State seems unsophisticated, old-fashioned, sentimental. Aaron Douglas's Afrofuturism upends racial hierarchies. It makes a mockery of the Art Deco of the Texas 1936 Centennial. It becomes obvious why the Hall of Negro Life was torn down and two murals were destroyed. The 1936 Texas Centennial is not one of a kind. Instead, it's one of a set of empire exhibitions of the 1930s. Nor has the triumphalist white supremacy of the 1936 Texas Centennial gone unnoticed. In Border Renaissance, John Moran Gonzalez deals with it at length. Mark Crinson, in his book, Modern Architecture and the End of Empire, discusses how Art Deco and modernist architecture is used in the imperial systems. And his book also discusses the empire expositions and the exhibitions. Patricia A. Morton, in her book, Hybrid Modernities, Architecture and Representation at the 1931 Colonial Exposition, Paris, shows how Art Deco and other modernist architecture is employed to represent white supremacy. In the book, Art Deco, 1910 to 1939, edited by Charlotte Benton, Tim Benton, and Ghislaine Wood, there's chapter 39, Art Deco in South Africa by Dipti Bhagat. In this chapter, Bhagat shows how Art Deco is used to support white supremacy in South Africa. Crinson makes five points. One, there is a presumption that modern architecture and architects are inherently progressive. Two, there is a presumption that modern architecture has nothing to do with nationalism or imperialism. Three, as a consequence, historians of modern architecture have simply ignored the questions of modern architecture and nationalism, imperialism. Four, Crinson argues instead that modern architecture has a relationship to imperialism which needs to be examined. Five, modern architecture obscured the violence inherent in maintaining an imperial system. Reading from Crinson's book, architecture as an arm of imperialism is seen, and seen episodically at best, as an embarrassment to modernism and part of what it contests. But modernism arose at the peak of European colonial empires. Even if its own histories barely acknowledge this, and even if empire seems like one of the things it consigns to history. But it was also a form for the veiling and naturalizing the violence. One assumption is that the values of modernist architecture are understood to transcend issues of national power and sovereignty over other peoples. Modernist architecture was silent so it can remain for its historians in relation to imperialism. The other assumption is that modernism's advocates were anti-imperialist, 
Yet if this opposition to imperialism was there, it was subconscious at best. There are few anti-imperialist statements by modernist architecture. And where we do find them, they tend to be voiced by only a few non-Western clients. Perhaps it might be better to speculate that modernism was not a disavowal of imperialism. It was actively employed as a way of improving the function of the colonial city. Dr. Morton, in her book, Hybrid Modernities, shows how the French colonizers divided architecture into so-called advanced and less advanced and primitive classifications to support racial hierarchy. Reading from Dr. Morton's book, the exposition classified and organized colonial objects and people it displayed according to the principles of hierarchy and evolution, with Europe at the pinnacle and less evolved civilizations ranked below it. The architecture of the pavilions was a medium for bearing the good news of colonization and at the same time was a physical manifestation of this invented colonial reality. Dr. Morton, in translation, quotes a prominent French magazine to show how the exposition was popularly understood by the French. Reading, under the stucco of the fragile pavilions, it will be easy for the visitor to discover the solid edifice that the colonialists of all periods and of all races have cemented with their blood. There is not a room, not a stand in these pavilions that does not translate some substantial victory of colonialization over ignorance, fanaticism, violence, the misery of the bodies and soul. Dr. Morton also discusses how some types of architecture were ignored, omitted, so that this hierarchy of race could be preserved. Reading from her book, Crossbreeding Between Colonizer and Colonized, so prevalent in both Paris and the colonies, had to be edited out to preserve the bipolar equation that justified colonialism. The heterotopias of both the metropole and the colonies, mixtures of native and metropolitan cultures and blood, had to be deleted to the greatest extent possible or the collection would not be read in the desired manner. Thinking back to the Hall of Negro Life at the Texas Centennial Exposition, we are reminded of another violation of an intended racial hierarchy. This is the architecture representing modern France at the Colonial Exposition. These are the supposedly less advanced architectures of an intermediate type. The lower right postcard is of the Dutch East Indies put on by the Netherlands government. The bottom two postcards one of Anchor Watt and one of the Dutch East Indies, both show the utilization of fractal geometry in their architecture and are hence very sophisticated. The top left is an Algerian building with a minaret, and the top right is a pavilion from Vietnam. None of these buildings are less evolved. These are the African pavilions at the Colonial Exposition. Upper left is French West Africa. It's a restaurant. Upper right, it's a French West Africa mosque. Lower right, it's Cameroon and Togo. Lower left, it's French Equatorial Africa. Nowadays, these would all be seen as examples of appropriate technology the sophisticated use of local materials and many innovative features. However, then in 1931, these would be seen as primitive or less advanced. At the Colonial Exposition in Paris, there was a pavilion for the Belgian Congo. And on your right there, you see an arrow pointing out where the monster 
Leopold II was honored. At these self-congratulatory empire expositions, it is questionable exactly who is civilized and who is the so-called savage. The 1936 Empire Exhibition in Johannesburg is of special interest in terms of comparison to the 1936 Texas Centennial. Both places have a significant non-white population. Both have a history of violence and the establishment of white domination. Both have pioneer narratives. Dr. Bagot explains how Art Deco is used to sustain white supremacy at the Johannesburg Empire Exhibition, reading the spectacular Art Deco styling of the exhibition's built form and decorative program was an exemplary expression of an empire dominion that asserted during the 1920s and 1930s a young white nationhood. Reading, in this young nation's eclectic deco-inspired form, style and motifs framed Africa's white dominion as culturally sophisticated and racially distinct. The duality of South Africa's celebratory modernism an impetus at once national and cosmopolitan was seen at its most complex in the exhibition's representation of South Africa's black populations as primitive and exotic. This posture conveyed the idea of modernity to rival that of Europe and Africa, but was also conceived in a local context as a means of asserting a white South Africa's cultural difference from the native and its supremacy over him. Here we have the Johannesburg Light Tower. This is the Light Tower at the Texas Centennial. They both have pioneers and covered wagons. Below is one of the many representations of pioneers at the Texas Centennial. Above is a representation of war truckers on a postcard and also on a medal that they issued for the Johannesburg Empire Exhibition. These are the modernist buildings at the Johannesburg Empire Exhibition to represent the advanced culture of white people. These postcards on the right, printed in sepia brown, are 1936 Empire Exhibition postcards of the exhibition to represent Africans in South Africa. The title for the top postcard is Native Women About Their Household Duties. The title for the bottom postcard is Native Piccaninnies. On the left is the cover of the brochure for the 1936 Johannesburg Empire Exhibition. On the right is a page from this brochure for the United Kingdom Pavilion. Notice the building has rays coming out of it, and it's a modern Art Deco building. Juxtapositioned against this illustration of a literally radiant Art Deco building is a picture of Africans having a dance. The caption reads, Native women at a wedding dance. This is one of the most colorful ceremonies that the visitor to South Africa can see. The gleaming white Art Deco building representing the advanced civilization of the white imperialists is juxtapositioned against African dancers who within the value system of these white imperialists would represent the primitive. As Dr. Bagot pointed out, Art Deco is used here to represent racial hierarchy. This is another page from the same brochure. What you see here is that when something doesn't fit their theories of racial hierarchy, 
they have a total failure of brain function. The text of the page is on the right. Let me read it. The mysterious ruins of Zimbabwe, a source of argument to archaeologists of five continents, will be reproduced in replica as a Rhodesian pavilion. The silent mystery of these ruins, standing in the heart of Africa, are a challenge to the science the world over. It is believed in some quarters that Zimbabwe is built by the slaves of the Queen of Sheba and that it was from the mines in the vicinity that she got her supplies of gold. The obvious answer that ruins in the heart of Africa were probably built by Africans they can't accept. They cannot conceive that it could be true. They believe that somehow a white person has to be involved with this in some way, shape, or fashion, so they speculate about the Queen of Sheba. It may be just as well that the white colonists never came to understand that these ruins are built by Africans, for had they come to understand this, would they have torn them down like the Hall of Negro Life? This understanding of race, white supremacy, and empire expositions has been out there for some time now. It's not new, it's not considered radical, it's pretty much the standard understanding of these expositions. It's only in insular Dallas that there's a total unawareness of the meaning of the 1936 Texas Centennial. We need to shut down the centennial classroom that teaches the public lessons of white supremacy. We need to stop teaching the triumph of the Texas white will. Special thanks to the Fine Art Museums of San Francisco for the use of an image of Aaron Douglas's painting, Aspirations. These figures are part of the iron work of the doors at the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts building at Fair Park. You'll note all the figures are white because in the 1936 Texas Centennial, white people did everything. Non-white people didn't do anything. These were the official colors of the Pan American Exposition in 1937. Aztec red, Toltec green, Mayan blue, Inca gold. The colors shown in this slide are not necessarily the colors that were used. This brief presentation on the Pan American Exposition of 1937 is confined to topics in relation to the Texas Centennial of 1936. Further research into the Pan American Exposition needs to be done. This is a Pan American exhibit hall at the Pan American Exposition in Dallas in 1937. It is the Ford Building of the Texas Centennial in 1936 repurposed for this exhibition. One of the topics I want to raise is the erasure of Latin America from Fair Park. The Pan American Exhibit Hall at the Exposition in 1937 was torn down the following year. Besides the Hall of Negro Life, there is another building with a non white identity torn down. Why the Pan American Exhibit Hall was torn down is an historical question which needs further research. The Dallas Morning News reported on the painting of Fair Park for the Pan American Exhibition. I read, The color that formed the background of life for ancient American peoples is taking possession of the Esplanade at the Pan American Exposition where the six porticos of the buildings are being transformed into six gigantic Aztec temple entrances. These are two postcards of the porticos at the Pan American Exposition. How accurate they are, I cannot say. Continued with the previously mentioned article, painted in luminous greens, the porticos stand out from the rest of the buildings. The columns supporting the corners are being painted 
is Inca and gold, and the ceilings a bright Aztec red. Around the top is a brilliant frieze of geometric patterns in blue, purple, green, and red. Motifs for the porticos and the rest of the Pan American decorative theme are taken from the ancient ruins of the two continents and simplified to appeal to modern eyes. Two more postcards. Again, how accurately these depict the porticos at the Pan American Exposition, I do not know. Aztec sacrifice was used to represent the indigenous cultures of the Americas. For public entertainment, there were regular reenactments of Aztec sacrifice at the Pan American Exhibition. Imagine, if you will, all of European culture being represented by witch burnings. This reenactment is about maintaining white hierarchy. At some point, the colors of the Pan American Exposition were painted over. The theme of the 1936 Centennial Exposition was a racial triumph over Latin Mexico. The colors and themes of the Pan American Exhibition would be fundamentally in conflict with the theme of racial triumph over a Latin people. Nor would they represent the white supremacist Texas as modern and an empire in a modern cosmopolitan world of imperial white supremacy. So these colors would be painted over. The repainting of the porticos was erasing history. Modern preservation seeks to preserve the accretions of time, those things that accumulate on an object or a place or a building. There are those who will tell you that the Interior Department has determined that 1936 is a significant time period for Fair Park, and therefore everything should be restored to that point in time. But these standards, these ideas, these determinations are sort of pulled out of the air by small cliques. Though the designation of the Department of the Interior as to what the most significant time period for Fair Park is, does determine that the most significant thing about Fair Park is its triumphalist white supremacy.